Let me encourage you to take a Bible and open it with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, where we will be reading in just a few moments. Hebrews 13 is going to be our first passage of Scripture. Thank you for being here this evening. As Nathan mentioned at the outset of our assembly, we have been walking through over the course of the last several weeks a very important study for the life of the church here at Laurel Canyon. We are so very blessed and we have reminded ourselves of that fact several different times over the course of the last few weeks. And we are blessed to have communication from our Creator, from our great King and Head concerning what He wants this body of believers to look like. And as Nathan mentioned, it is our goal to continue to build upon that scriptural foundation. If you're visiting with us, we are certainly very glad that you are here. I would ask that you appreciate the fact that you are coming into part five of five this evening. And that we're going to take for granted this evening that there have been four lessons that have walk through the, the textual passages of Scripture that we have concerning deacons and elders. If you would like to get a copy of those, then please be sure to get a copy of those on the welcome table in the foyer before you leave. We spent significant time in 1 Timothy chapter 3 reading God's instructions concerning deacons, the sort of men that they ought to be. Not only that, but we went back to the historical book of Acts and different letters learning what we could concerning what it meant to be a servant as far as God was concerned in the New Testament. And then we spend an entire week just trying to appreciate what it is that elders or overseers, pastors, these great stewards as they are described of God's flock, the way that those men and, and the, the terms that are used to describe them were used in the Bible and what we can learn from those terms. And then last Sunday evening we spent significant time in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1 looking at each one of these qualities that these men ought to possess all along from even before this study began. Our elders passed along to you that of course it is very difficult to cover every element of uh, this sort of a study within the span of just a few sermons. They knew, of course, just as I knew going into this, that there would be questions concerning deacons and elders. Questions that arise from a very practical point of view as we do our best to appreciate what we have and apply that into real life scenarios. And that is what this evening is all about. Our body here had about two and a half weeks in light of our study to submit any written questions concerning deacons and elders. And then I was asked to arrange those and to do my best to, to provide scriptural insight on those this evening. We begin in Hebrews chapter 13. I want to thank you for the time that you took in submitting those questions because there is nothing trivial, of course, about what we are talking about this evening. That comes through loud and clear in verse 17 of Hebrews 13 where God's people are told, Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. It is that sort of thing, of course, those sorts of sentences that would lead us to understand when it comes to the appointing of these leaders, these pastors, elders, overseers, this is one of the most important things a church will ever do. 
And we've tried to grow in our appreciation over the course of the last couple of weeks that this is much more than just a trivial, artificial checklist. This goes much deeper than just the skin deep things I can see on the outside. Well, this is a man who has been married for many years and he's married to the same woman that he has always been married to. And so that must be all that there is to what God has to say concerning the marriage of this man. It's not so. We've tried to grow in our appreciation of that. Or th this man has three kids and all three of those kids have been immersed in water at some point in the past and so that must be all that God has in mind concerning the family of this man. Not so. We've tried to appreciate that in the giving of these qualities, God is calling for careful consideration Number one of the character of this man. In both Timothy and Titus, we read there, there are differences there. Acknowledged. We'll note a few more of those this evening. But at the head of both of those lists, the very first words concerning this man is that he ought to be above reproach. That speaks to his character. That being said, in many respects, what we're doing this evening is entering into the realm of judgments. I appreciated very, very much what Nathan had to say. I had no idea that he was going to say those things. I appreciated them very much. That has been my goal all along. But we understand the reasons... These questions have been asked over the course of the last couple of weeks. The reason these questions are asked all over this world as people turn their attention to this, the reason that there has been book after book after book after book written concerning these issues literally for centuries is we are entering this evening into realms of matters of judgment. And we can understand that if we think about it. It's one thing to understand this overseer must be a man. It's relatively cut and dry. When is that man and his family hospitable? We're entering into the realm of human judgment. We understand that God requires the man, requires that man's family to be hospitable, but one, when does a man become hospitable. What must he do in order to show himself hospitable? It's one thing to say this man must be a husband. When does he go from being a recent convert to not being a recent convert? Of course, we're entering into the realm of human judgment as to exactly when that is. It is one thing to read that he must not be a drunkard. We also are told he must not be greedy for gain. And how do we measure that sort of thing? How do we know it when we see it? And I would suggest to you, of course, that depending upon the culture in which we live, if you, nearly anyone in this room, lived the way that you do right now in the jungles of the Philippines, our Philippine brethren might have something to say about the way that you manage your lifestyle and handle what you have. We understand that greedy for gain is a God-breathed quality that must be respected but in the applying of that, we are very much entering into the realm of human judgment. When does a man cross the line from a typical human male to being quick-tempered? We know it when we see it. We most certainly know it when we are on the receiving end of it. But when does a man come to be quick-tempered the way that God has warned us against. 
good, sincere, conscientious brethren have reached different conclusions concerning some of the matters of judgment that we're looking into this evening. And I'm non under no illusion that good, sincere, conscientious brethren might not disagree within this room by the time that we are done. But as Nathan mentioned, our goal, of course, is to base every judgment, every opinion on what we have from God's Word. That is our goal this evening. Would you open your Bibles with me back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 15. I have broken down the questions that were submitted under a few basic headings. And the first of those is concerning authority. Let me reassure you that there were multiple times that the same sort of question was submitted just in different ways. If you don't see the exact wording of your exact question, I hope that you will see the spirit of your question. Perhaps as it was asked by another person, but I have done my best to, to accurately represent the spirit of every question that was submitted over the course of the last two and a half weeks. First of all, concerning authority. One very good question that was submitted. How do we avoid binding things on potential servants of the church where God has not bound? And I would suggest to you that the asking of that question manifests a great attitude of maturity. Because this is a, a problem that many people have slipped into in the past. One of the clearest examples of that we find in the Gospels concerning the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1, we're told by Matthew that the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God? For the sake of your tradition. In verse 7, he says, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Clearly there is a clash here between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Two thousand years ago they were not always lining up. And we get an even clearer Glimpse, if we turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23, into the mindset of many of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1, Jesus said to the crowds and to His disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do. Why would he tell them to do that? One of the reasons is they preach but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Or in verse 23, Woe to you, where Jesus addresses these scribes and Pharisees directly and calls them hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Even 2,000 years ago, if we had time, we could go back 4,000 years ago into the Old Testament and find this human tendency to disregard what God has said and place great regard on what we think. 
maybe leading us to take prohibition, sometimes of our own making, even further than the Lord intended because they harmonize with our agenda and maybe we reassure ourselves and we tell other people, well, this is the, the safe side of things. All the while missing the real point of Jesus' instructions, God's instructions, binding where God has not bound, focusing in on a gnat and choking that little gnat while swallowing a camel. I would suggest to you that pitfall can very easily happen in the territory of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1. And to do so, to strain the gnat and to swallow the camel can be just as destructive as loosing where God has not loosed. How can we avoid binding things on potential servants of the church where God has not bound? I would suggest to you it begins with humility. We must be humble. We must be careful. We must be reverent enough to ask, why do I believe what I believe? Do I believe what I believe because this is what I have always heard from human teachers? Do I believe what I believe because this is what I have read in my favorite book on the subject? Do I believe what I believe because I have an agenda as to the way things I would like them to turn out and so I'm going to grab those gnats and strain them and swallow where I need to swallow in order to push myself and perhaps other people in the direction I want them to go? Am I being honest with the text? Am I being honest with my own motives? Is this a matter wherein I am quarreling, but quarreling over my own opinions? Of course, we know that God has a great deal to say about that to Christians. It begins with humility. And it begins with asking, why do I believe what I believe? Can I show from the Scriptures what I'm teaching and binding on other people? Would you turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12? One question that was asked, what sort of authority do elders have? A very important question. Very quickly... Through this, I'm just going to show a variety of different passages on the screen behind me. If you've got more questions, if you don't catch some of these and would like them later on, then of course, I would be happy to, to talk with you about those, provide those to you. But any discussion of authority has to begin with God. In John chapter 12 and verse 49, Jesus says, I have not spoken of my own authority. But the Father who sent me has Himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that His commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus recognized and was not ashamed to talk about the ultimate authority of the Heavenly Father. That being said, we read, of course, in the Gospels and throughout the rest of the New Testament that God gave all authority to His Son in heaven and on earth. Authority that will eventually, according to Paul, be returned to the Father at the end of time. Paul reflects on this in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 27. God has put all things in subjection under His feet, the feet of Christ. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that He is accepted, the Father is accepted, who put all things in subjection under the feet of the Son. 
when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Building on that truth, throughout the New Testament, Jesus Christ is presented as the head of his church, as the king of his kingdom, as the savior of his body, as perfect in his rule, rule that cannot be overthrown. That being said, Jesus exercised authority in commissioning a specifically hand-selected group of men, described as apostles. In the Gospel of John, chapter 17, on the eve of his betrayal, he says to those apostles, I have given them, or he prays, first of all, to the Father about these apostles, saying, I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And he sent these men with a promise. In John 14, verse 25, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That was the promise. And it was a promise of such weight that Jesus said things like, Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. It was a promise with such weight that Paul was able to write, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. Incidentally, in the same letter, what we have is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Issues concerning marriage. Many of them just as sensitive as some of the things we talk about this evening. Paul was very clear in saying, These things are a command of the Lord. But also offering his opinion. His personal judgment as a disciple of Christ. He wanted people to know there are certain things that God has expressly commanded and in the conveying of those things you need to understand that even though I am the one God is using to write these things down in accordance with the promise of Jesus Christ, these are a commandment of the Lord. When Paul offers his own personal insight, his own personal opinion as an individual disciple of Christ, he is careful to do so. I would suggest to you we also ought to be careful to delineate between the two. Under the guidance of these apostles, we noted last Sunday, they instructed, they instituted, they modeled, they spread the idea that overseers ought to be appointed in every local church. They went about doing that very thing. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, these men were charged with the responsibility to exercise oversight. We noted last Sunday, these are more than good examples. These are men, by God's design, charged with exercising oversight. Paul calls elders in the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 28, or Acts chapter 20, verse 28, overseers charged with caring for the church of God with which he obtained with his own blood. Peter, as a fellow elder, writes to elders and charges them that they would shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight. I would suggest to you this evening that there are two realms in which the authority of elders is administered. 
There is number one, the divine realm. Wherein we are dealing with divine laws. There is someone who has made those laws. And it is not elders. In James chapter 4 and verse 12, we are told there is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. Legislative powers belong to Christ and to Christ alone. There is not an elder on planet earth with the authority to legislate laws to God's people as a law giver. An elder's responsibility when it comes to divine laws is to learn those, to be a student of those, as we emphasized last Sunday, to lead with an open book under the oversight of the chief shepherd. But there is also a realm, as we've already mentioned, of human judgment, where decisions must be made. Elders work to make those decisions in harmony with, in agreement with divine law. They strive to lead and to guide in light of divine law, but they understand and the people they are leading ought to understand. There are issues of judgment. God has charged elders to exercise oversight. That's going to involve in matters of human judgment and decision making, making, determining the course that a church is going to take in obeying God's law. Elders exercise oversight. They feed, they tend, they shepherd, they watch over, they guard, they guide as stewards of the chief shepherd. And in no uncertain terms, they are to be obeyed. They are to be submitted to as ones who are keeping watch over our souls. Would you open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5? Another category of questions that was submitted over the course of the last couple of weeks concerns an elder stepping down from service. One question was asked, is it possible for an elder who was once qualified to at any point become disqualified? And the scriptural answer to that question most certainly would appear to be yes. But God has given insight once again. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul has already written to Timothy concerning the qualifications, the qualities that this man ought to meet. And in 1 Timothy 5 verse 17, he says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty, Paul says to Timothy, in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. The context certainly appears to be throughout elders, overseers. Paul has expressed the expectation that elders would be appointed in every church. We emphasized last Sunday that in the absence of elders, something is unfinished, something is lacking, something needs great attention. Paul says, don't be hasty. Do not accept a charge against an elder except there be two or three 
witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. He once again draws our attention to God, to Christ Jesus as the chief shepherd. It is most certainly possible for anyone to step outside of the boundaries defined by the chief shepherd. We read of such a man, at least in a position of great influence, he is not specifically described by John as an elder, but it is a position of influence that needed to be corrected in the way that it was being exercised. In his third letter, verses 9 through 11, John says, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. If I come, I will bring up what he is doing, taking wicked nonsense, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, John says, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God, whoever does evil is has not seen God. Of course, we have nothing in the Scriptures that would lead us to believe. Once an elder, always an elder. This is not equivalent to a United States Supreme Court appointee that this is some sort of a lifetime appointment regardless. These men must walk under the authority once more of the chief shepherd. What Peter says to elders in 1 Peter 5, he couches under the idea that the chief shepherd is going to appear once again. Those who serve under his authority are stewards. And according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, it is required of stewards first and foremost that they be found faithful. Our allegiance first and foremost, is to Christ. And we all reverently, humbly serve under the scope of that authority. Another question that was asked on the same sort of vein, if a member feels that an elder should discontinue his service, how should the member go about communicating this? I would suggest to you, using 1 Timothy 5, the first question that ought to be asked is, there's some sort of a charge against this elder. We need to follow Paul's instructions. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Beyond that, I would suggest to you that we most certainly ought to walk within the wisdom of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophet. I should begin once again with why do I believe what I believe? What am I hoping to accomplish here? And why am I hoping to accomplish it? Am I being honest with my motives. If there is some sort of an issue that I feel is of utmost importance here within the life, the character of this man, have I talked with him? It most certainly is outside of the boundaries of the golden rule for me to talk with all sorts of other people before I talk to him. To try and rally a coup against the man before I ever talk to the man would certainly be outside of what Jesus is prescribing for all kingdom citizens. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, communication here is absolutely key. And as I communicate, I ought to communicate the way that I am called to communicate as a disciple of Christ, period. Seeking to speak the truth in love. 
And according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. As such, love would compel me to talk with this man. I mentioned last Sunday, I have watched my own father serve in this capacity in the past. I've served under three different elderships. And I can assure you that there is always more on the plate of an elder than most any member within the, the body of that local church has even a concept. Perhaps something's going on that I'm not even aware of. And I could grow in my appreciation, in my patience, in my kindness, first of all, by just talking with the man. Another category. If you open your Bibles with me back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we'll be in just a moment, a variety of different questions concerning an elder's marriage. One question, what does it mean to be the husband of one wife? We spent significant time talking about this over the course of the last two weeks. I would once again return us first and foremost to the idea of his character. What is his character bringing to his marriage? Does he love his wife as Christ loved the church? If so, it's one thing just to arbitrarily say, well, he's been married now for a very long time. He's always been married to the same woman. But he goes deeper than that. Within the context of 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1, what sort of character is he manifesting within the crucible of marriage? In the context of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, what sort of husband of one wife is he? What have we learned about his character within the context of marriage? We noted over the course of the last two weeks in connection with deacons and with elders. What we have in the original language of Scripture is a Greek phrase that includes two words. Or three words, I should say. The first of them simply meaning one. The second, the feminine noun that can mean either woman or wife. And the third one, a masculine noun meaning man. Literally what we have in the original language of Scripture is he must be a one woman, man. That immediately follows in both Timothy and Titus. As you can see, for example, in 1 Timothy 3, the call to be above reproach. Number one, he must be above reproach. Number two, in both lists, he must be the husband of one wife. Could I encourage you to think about that? Paul makes list after list after list in his letters. And especially when he is addressing the, the character of all of us as Christians, things that we ought to avoid concerning this world and its conduct, Paul is not shy to list works of the flesh. What happens when our minds are set on things above? And do you know what is at the top of the list over and over and over again? It's sexual immorality. Number one, list after list after list. It's interesting that Paul does not men mention in 1 Timothy 3 or in Titus chapter 1, this man must not be sexually immoral. I would suggest to you, this is about much more than just an arbitrary, is he married to the same woman he's always been married to? Number one, he must be above reproach. Number two, he must be a one-woman man. And he moves on from there. 
pointing us to a consideration of his character. Does this man respect God's original intention concerning marriage? One man, one woman for life. If he does not, if he's got the reputation of visiting prostitutes in the pagan temples around Ephesus or in the island of Crete or wherever it is, if he's got the, the, the recognized fault of having sexual relationships with other women, then most certainly he is not a one woman man. He might have been married to the same woman all along. But God, God is calling for more than just a superficial eye-level consideration. Does this mean that an elder can never have been divorced? What if it was a divorce sanctioned by the words of Jesus? And of course, such a question undoubtedly has Matthew chapter 19 in mind. When Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by saying, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, remember, this is the one through whom God was exercising ultimate authority, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Logically, that would lead us to the man who divorces his wife for the cause of sexual immorality and marries another, does not commit adultery. That man is no longer bound by God to his first wife. God himself is willing to bind that man to another woman. And as he lives within that second marriage, what reason do we have to believe that God would recognize that second marriage as not being above reproach? Would that not lead us to ask, if God does not hold this man in reproach, would he not consider him a one-woman man? That being said, a church ought to act carefully, with wisdom. Once again, what about this man's character? Perhaps his wife has been sexually unfaithful, and perhaps he did divorce her. But I would suggest to you that if half of the women, for instance, in the congregation know that this man has significant issues of character, a church ought to step very carefully. If this man has been married three or four times, Care concerning his character should be very carefully administered. Has he been faithful to the one woman to whom he has been bound? What should an elder do if his wife passes away? Was a question that was submitted. Is he no longer qualified to serve? I would return to the nature of his character. In the crucible of marriage, what sort of man has he shown himself to be? To illustrate, what if a man, a devoted husband, good father to faithful children, loses all of his children in a tragic car accident? Should he step down because he is no longer a father to children who are alive? I would return to his character. This is about character 
and leadership while his children were under his care. Now, that being said, of course, if a man loses his wife, can difficult, tragic, heart-rending circumstances affect his character? Of course they can. That man needs to be honest with himself. He needs to be honest with God. He needs to be honest with the flock. What if he continues to serve as an elder and starts dating again? I've got to tell you, I was not anticipating that question. But it was a question. And I would suggest to you that that is, once again, a delicate matter of human judgment. Let's suppose that this man believes that he can continue to serve. He has manifested the sort of character God is calling him to manifest. His wife has passed away. The congregation recognizes the character within the crucible of marriage that he has manifested and he continues to serve. What if he continues to serve and starts dating again? Of course, we need to think about this. Is this an area of life wherein he can do so and be above reproach? Is he being sober-minded as he does these things? Is he exercising self-control? Is he respectable in the way that he is handling this situation? I would suggest to you that is the flow that we have in the writings of Paul. Number one, he must be above reproach. He must be a one-woman man. And then let's talk. Is he sober-minded? Is he self-controlled? Is he respectable? If he steps down and eventually remarries, could he be appointed to serve as an elder once again? Let's say that conscientiously his wife has passed away and, and conscientiously he feels that he ought to step down. If that is the direction his conscience is driving him, then most certainly he should step down. That would lead me to Romans chapter 7 and verse 1. Where Paul says, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. I would suggest to you that ought to prompt questions. Does God hold such a one above reproach? It certainly seems to me as if he does. Does any of this mean that a man can serve as an elder who has never been married? I would suggest to you that the answer is no. Back to his character. The church has not had the opportunity to learn of his character within the crucible of marriage. All of us who have been married any length of time know that we can feel like we're pretty selfless people and then we get married. And marriage has the unique ability to manifest, to show just how selfish and self-centered we are. There is a reason that God has delivered the things that He has delivered. Would you turn with me very quickly to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? There were a variety of questions concerning an elder's children. Once again, I would suggest that character is key. That this involves much more than biologically being capable of having children. I have heard brethren argue over whether or not a man could serve as an elder when his children were adopted. I would suggest to you that this is much more 
than about being biologically capable of having children. This is about the character that he exhibits within the crucible of fatherhood. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul says of the Thessalonians, Being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our character toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you. Some of our English translations render that implored you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. What sort of character has been shown within the crucible of fatherhood? Is this a man who has exhorted and encouraged and charged and implored and had an effect on the life of his children? In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, the home is specifically mentioned as key in manifesting the character of this man. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care? for God's church. The home is key in manifesting the character of this man. Has he exhibited himself as quick-tempered, self-controlled, disciplined? That being said, there are a variety of practical questions that come up. If a man has one child and the Bible calls for children in passages like 1 Timothy 3, is the man qualified to serve as an elder. The word that we have in Greek literally means offspring, and I would suggest to you from cover to cover of God's revelation, it does not demand inherently a plurality. In Joshua chapter 4 and verse 6, Joshua told the children of Israel to set up memorial stones that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Should a father who hears that question from his one and only child be prepared to answer that question? Of course he should. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 26, God warning about days to come wherein your ch children will ask concerning, what do you mean by this service? Be careful how you answer. This is how you ought to answer. Does that mean that if I only have one child, I don't give a care in the world as to how I'm going to answer that question? Not for a moment. In Exodus 22, warning concerning rebellion and the subsequent punishments that would come. My wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Did that mean that if I only had one, I didn't need to worry about that? Not for a moment. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, fathers are told that they ought not to provoke their children to anger. That most certainly applies to a father who has one as it applies to a father who has ten. In Genesis chapter 21 and verse 7, Sarah, who had one and only child, exclaimed, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 3, Christians are told, you honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. We would all rebuke and try to correct 
an only son who says, well, it says children, and I'm an only child. I would suggest to you that is straining the gnat and swallowing the camel. To insist on this being a plural word is not even consistent in our own English language. I intentionally held on to a notice that was sent to our own home that parents with children must register their children for kindergarten before such and such a date. Everyone who speaks English fluently understands what that means. I would suggest to you that we must be very careful in drawing a line where God Himself has not drawn a line. What does the phrase, and His children are believers, mean in Titus chapter 1 and verse 6? I mentioned earlier that Timothy and Titus have different language. Paul is writing to two different men. And my caution would be, as we read these and scrutinize them carefully, that we ought to avoid pitting them against each other. The same author is behind both of them. Let's use them both to enhance a more complete understanding. In Titus 1 and verse 6, If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, Paul says, He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? If all that we have is Titus chapter 1 and verse 6, I would suggest to you that we come out in one area of interpretation. If we do not pit Titus against 1 Timothy... If we use both of them to enhance our understanding, perhaps we come out at a different, slightly, point of interpretation. Paul seems in 1 Timothy 3 to highlight specifically the household of this man. What sort of character did this man show within the crucible of fatherhood while his children were expected to be submissive as members of his own household. My own father continues to have a household. If I understand God's design, God's intention from the very beginning is that I would leave that household, that if I am married, I would leave father and mother and that I would cleave to my wife and that we would become one flesh and establish our own household. We need to step carefully here. Can a man be an elder if he has unfaithful children? Let's appreciate the fact that in a perfect Christian environment, even though such a thing we know does not exist, but even if it did exist, that is no guarantee that children will remain faithful after they leave their parents' household. We have that shown to us over and over and over again. We've got a principle, most surely, in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, concerning accountability. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Even in the perfect garden of Eden, with a perfect heavenly father that was no guarantee very evidently that Adam and Eve would remain completely faithful to that perfect father so likewise adult children 
will go their own way and make their own decisions. What ought we to do if an elder has an unfaithful child? Some would go back to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I would caution that any time we go back to something like the book of Proverbs, we appreciate the sort of literature we are dealing with. This is not a book full of unconditional divine promises. This is a book of wise statements. Sometimes wisdom manifests itself in different ways. In one passage in Proverbs, we are told, Do not answer a fool according to his folly. In the very next verse, we are told, Answer a fool according to his folly. Which is it? We appreciate this is a book full of divine, wise statements. Just because... A mother and a father train up a child in the way that he or she should go. That is no divine promise that they will not depart from it. Otherwise, we have exited the realm of free will. What if the children no longer live at home? Can an elder continue to serve his adult children who were once faithful, but have turned away from God? I would suggest to you this is squarely within the realm of human judgment. That we must be very careful how we handle Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, that we would not pit them against each other, but that we would use them both to enhance our complete understanding. And I would return one more time to the element of his character. What did he demonstrate within the crucible of his home, of his own household, about his ability, about his character behind the ability to feed, to tend, to shepherd, to watch over, to guard, to guide? That most certainly seems to be the emphasis that Paul is placing in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Concerning the future, if a man's name, the question was asked, is presented before the congregation for consideration and I do not believe he is qualified, what should I do? My question first and foremost would be how would they have handled that situation in Acts chapter 6? Granted, it is a different scenario, but we seem to be being given principles beginning in Acts chapter 6 concerning service, leadership within the church in its most infant of days. I would suggest to you that these people needed to characterize themselves with love. The love that we read of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They would need to manifest the sort of spirit that Paul was prescribing in Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. It goes back to being honest about why I believe what I believe and am I being honest about my motives. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of of others. In 1 Peter 5, and verse 5, you who are younger, Peter says, you be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. With that in mind, we appreciate the fact that there is one chief shepherd to whom we are all accountable. And if a man's name is presented before the congregation for consideration that I do not believe is qualified, it begins with communication. So much of this revolves around communication. If I don't feel comfortable talking with this man before he is appointed as an elder, I've got already an enormous problem on my hands. It begins with honest, 
loving communication. Finally, this evening, the question was asked, who ultimately makes the decision and chooses elders? We could very easily, of course, include deacons as well. We referenced Acts chapter 6 earlier. Undoubtedly within the scope of that infant church, there is a sense in which the group was told to look out among themselves. Look for these sorts of men. The twelve instruct men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Undoubtedly, this is a congregational work. But could I suggest to you this evening that when a church is blessed with an existing eldership, that eldership by no means takes a back seat and just waits to see what the congregation is going to do. They, by the nature of their work, so very oftentimes know more about any given man or woman or family or household or situation than nearly anyone else within the congregation does. This also is an area wherein elders lead. They shepherd, they guide, they guard the flock. That being said, The reason, of course, that all of this came to be over the course of the last two and a half weeks is because our elders have been given several different names for those that members of this body believe qualify as deacons. All of this began because several names have been submitted to our elders of men, members of our congregation believe, meet the qualities of deacons. The elders, having gotten those suggestions, asked me if I would be willing to refresh us not only about deacons, but while we were in that section of Scripture, of course, to look at what the Scriptures have to say concerning elders as well. This is something that we all need to keep at the forefront of our minds as members of the body of Christ. I have done what the elders asked me to do and at this point you will hear more from our elders in weeks, months ahead concerning where we as a body go from here because this is their work of leading, guiding, shepherding. Let me say that I appreciate very, very much not only the submission of your questions, but your very kind attention. This is the longest I have stood on this stage in six and a half years, and I don't take that for granted. I appreciate very, very much the fact that you have been so patient, and I appreciate the fact as well that many of the things that I have tried to walk us through biblically might create further questions in your mind. Can I tell you from my personal point of view, there is probably nothing more stressful in life than to be asked to do this sort of thing. Appreciating the fact that it is one thing to preach through a text. I'm love to do that all day long. It is another thing to appreciate the fact that when we go from the text to real life scenarios, some of those demand that we go down the pathway of human judgment. I have tried very carefully this evening to stay within the bounds of what we have, to share my understanding of what we have, and and to lead us down the pathway of logical, sound conclusions. Because that has been my aim, I have not said everything that could be said about these issues. And I've done that for a reason. I've done that because I believe that's the way 
in this setting it ought to be handled. That being said, if you want more of my personal opinion, all that you have to do is ask. And I would love to continue to talk with you about these things. Let's be people who love the Lord first and foremost, who communicate in Bible ways, who speak the truth in love. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, esteem others as more important than ourselves. If you this evening know that you need a relationship with God. We have already this evening multiple times in 1 Peter 5 noticed what Peter has to say about the chief shepherd and the fact that he is going to appear again. There is a great day coming. And if we could help you in responding to what God has said in His Word, if we could help you in answering the call of Jesus, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. If we could pray with you, if we could pray for you, all that we want is to do what God says. And if that is your aim this evening, would you let us know how we can help by coming to the front while we stand and sing.